we go. I hope you enjoy. It's my second video ever. Welcome to Cosmology 101 Episode 2. In this episode, we're going to take a look at both models of the Sun. The standard model versus the electric Sun. Without further ado, let's get started. Star Birth the standard model sun birth, somewhere long ago and far away, an old star died, creating a supernova, which eventually became what we see as nebula. In this supernova, they say that all of the heavy elements that are on Earth were created and fused over a long period of time. This somehow some way became a swirling disk of dust and gas. The one thing that always bothered me about that theory is that if the star that died still had all this hydrogen left over to create one or more new baby stars, then why did it die in the first place? That has never really been addressed in anything that I've seen. So now we have a swirling disk of dust and gas. Then the remaining dust and gas that was left out of the star, eventually through the, what is known as accretion, became the other planets, which stuck together like little dust bunnies and all eventually became this planet. And then the collapsing nebula somehow ignited and then it blew all the refuse out of the way and what was left over was a solar system and the star was born from the remains of the star that died but there's that problem with if there was all this hydrogen left over why did the star die in the first place and how did the hydrogen become perfectly placed out so that a family of stars could be born if more than one star was born at the same time. The Standard Model Sun The Sun is a huge sphere of glowing gas. It produces energy and light, which make life on Earth possible. The temperature of the Sun varies tremendously, and not in ways that you might realize. At the core of the Sun, gravitational attraction produces immense pressure and temperature which can reach more than 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, 15 million degrees Celsius. Hydrogen atoms get compressed and fused together to create helium. This process is called nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion produces huge amounts of energy. The energy radiates outward to the sun's surface, atmosphere, and beyond. From the core, energy moves to the radiative zone, where it bounces around for up to one million years before moving up to the convective zone, the upper layer of the sun's interior. Now this radiative zone has intrigued my interest, so I wanted to delve into it a little bit more. And it's also called radiation zone, radiative zone, is hypothetically a region or layer of a star's interior where energy is primarily transported toward the exterior by means of radiative diffusion and thermal conduction rather than by convection. Energy travels through the radiation zone in the form of electromagnetic radiation as photons. Matter in a radiation zone is so dense that photons can travel only a short distance before they are absorbed or scattered by another particle, gradually shifting to longer wavelength as they do so. For this reason, it takes an average of 171,000 years for gamma rays from the core of the sun to leave the radiation zone. Over this range, the temperature of the plasma drops from 15 million K near the core down to 1.5 million K at the base 
of the convection zone. In a radiation zone, the temperature gradient, the change in temperature as the function of the radius is given by this math equation. I think it's worth noting that no other thing known contains a radiative zone in nature except stars. temperature here drops significantly. Large bubbles of hot plasma form a soup of ionized atoms and move upwards to the photosphere. The temperature in the photosphere is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It is here that the sun's radiation is detected as visible light. Sunspots on the photosphere are cooler and darker than the surrounding area. At the center of big sunspots, the temperature can be as low as 7300 degrees Fahrenheit, 4000 degrees Celsius. I know astronomers like to use Kelvin. We won't. The chromosphere, the next layer of the sun's atmosphere, is a bit cooler at 7800 degrees. Visible light from the chromosphere is usually too weak to be seen against the brighter photosphere. But during total solar eclipses, when the moon covers the photosphere, the chromosphere can be seen as a red rim around the sun. Temperatures rise dramatically in the corona, which can also only be seen during an eclipse, as plasma streams upward like points on a crown, which the word corona is Latin for crown. The corona can get to about 3.5 million degrees Fahrenheit. As the corona cools, losing heat and radiation, Matter is blown off as the solar wind. The sun is the largest and most massive object in the solar system. It is about 93 million miles from Earth. The distance is called an astronomical unit, or 1 AU, and is used to measure distances throughout the solar system. The sun's light and heat takes about eight minutes to reach us, which leads to another way to state the distance to the sun, about eight light minutes. And that is the standard model of the sun. Mainstream theory regards the cause of such granulation to originate from convection columns emanating from the solar interior. Jurgens was highly critical of the notion that violent convection from an exploding nuclear core can be observed in the photosphere of the sun. The electric sun theory or electric sun hypothesis is the idea that the sun and stars derives the main source of their power electrically from its surroundings rather than from within by nuclear fusion. The mainstream view, which has never been duplicated by science on Earth. The electric sun is often attributed to a 1972 article by Ralph Jurgens, who acknowledges priority to a 1958 Melvin Cook monograph, an inspiration from Emmanuel Velikovsky, Cosmos Without Gravitation, the electron sun theory, including Wall Thornhill and Don Scott. The electric sun model is a part of the electric universe theory and is being scientifically tested by the Sapphire Project. Where I'm 
I'm going to read a synopsis from Wal Thornhill from his website, hollowscience.com. Plasma physicists argue that stars are formed by an electromagnetic pinch effect on a widely dispersed gas and dust. The pinch is created by the magnetic force between the parallel current filaments that are part of the huge electric currents flowing inside a galaxy. It is far more effective than gravity in concentrating matter and unlike gravity, it can remove excess angular momentum that tends to prevent collapse. Stars will form like beads on a wire until gravity takes over. The late Ralph Jurgens, an engineer from Flagstaff, Arizona in the 1970s, took the next mental leap to suggest that the electrical input doesn't stop there and that stars are not thermonuclear engines. This is obvious when the sun is looked at from an electrical discharge perspective. The galactic currents that create the stars persist to power them. Stars behave as electrodes in a galactic glow discharge. Bright stars, like our sun, are great concentrated balls of lightning. The matter inside the stars becomes positively charged as electrons drift toward the surface. The resulting internal electrostatic forces prevent stars from collapsing gravitationally and occasionally cause them to give birth by electrical fissioning to form companion stars and gas giant planets. Sudden brightening or a nova outburst marks such an event that elucidates why stars commonly have partners and why most of the giant planets so far detected closely orbit their parent star. Stellar evolution theory in the age of stars is an elaborate fiction the appearance of a star is determined largely by its electrical environment and can change suddenly. Plasma physicists and electrical engineers are best able to recognize plasma discharge phenomena. Stellar physics is in the wrong hands. And that was Wal Thornhill on his hollowscience.com website because if it was something that they were not worried about, they would not be in such a panic to put all this mental pollution on the internet to try to hide the real story. That's just my opinion. The standard solar model, this is the culprit. Arthur Eddington deduced the nuclear energy concept of stars. He based it on a number of premises, all of which were false, and yet he had the temerity to say it should not be too difficult to understand such a simple thing as a star. He used gravity and simple gas laws applicable on Earth but not in the solar plasma, which resulted in a simplistic model that took no account of the observed complexities of the Sun. It is an impossible solar model because the coronal temperature is in the millions of degrees, the chromosphere is 10,000, photosphere 5,700 and the core requires a temperature of the order of 15 million degrees and an unreal density for hypothetical nuclear fusion. Even the nuclear fusion reactions cannot be tested and in order to make it work it involved quantum tunnelling and all sorts of uh, magical tricks to try and get a theory which would work. It was very clever but is it real? It also needs a radiative zone unknown in, inside any other hot body. That had to be put in, of course, because you've got intense X-rays coming from a 15 million degree core, and somehow that had to be converted into just heat and light at the surface. Now here's Ralph Jurgens. You've seen him before, some of you. He presented in the 70s, 1972, a gas discharge model of the sun. He wrote, the modern astrophysical concept that ascribes the sun's energy to thermonuclear reactions deep in the solar interior is contradicted by nearly every observable aspect of the sun. I was inspired when I read his article. He provided a detailed gas discharge model applicable to all stars, a single model for all stars. This is uh, quite distinct from uh, modern cosmology, which has a separate theory for every star. 
So electric stars, like the lights of a great city at night, stars are lit at great distances from where their power is being generated. Each star forms the focus of a Z-pinch in the current stream. An electric star, for stars like the sun, the current flows in dark mode, so we don't see the spectacular glow mode, bipolar wiring harnesses of supernovae and planetary nebulae. But every star has this form in its current feed system. Then how do we look at the sun within the heliosphere? Because these plasma sheaths, or the heliosphere, protects what's inside from the electrical environment outside. Most of the voltage that drives the sun occurs out at that distant boundary. This is why the spacecraft that are traversing that region at present are suffering so many surprises because nothing's behaving the way they expected. They thought it was just a collisional boundary. It's not. Most of the voltage that drives the sun occurs across that thin boundary and the result is, as Ralph Jurgen suggested, it's the origin of most of the cosmic rays in our galaxy. Every star has this cosmic ray accelerator at the boundary of its heli heliosphere. <coughs> It's called the virtual cathode because if the sun forms the anode here and it's just a coronal discharge into thin air, thin vacuum, there is a virtual cathode set up by the plasma. It's the boundary of the sun's electrical influence. It is the virtual cathode in the stellar corona discharge and most of the sun's driving voltage appears across the plasma sheath. A very important point because uh, all of those who've um, the pseudo-skeptics, I call them, who attack this model, say, where are all the relativistic electrons streaming past the Earth? You know, we should see them. The point is, if you'll notice, that this here is the voltage gradient through most of the heliosphere. The only place where you'll see swift changes in that uh, voltage gradient is at the virtual cathode. You'll notice the size of it here and this little blip when you get into the corona, that's the thing that accelerates the uh, particles in the corona and heats them to 20 million degrees. The cosmology and the electric universe can inspire, in my opinion, a scientific revolution of unparalleled scope. We see on the left there a planetary nebula and a plasma discharge tube, just as a, an example of the similarities. And they hinge on one simple question in both cases, plasma cosmology and the electric universe, does electricity play a role in the universe? The electric universe cosmology, a guiding principle of this is convergence of all human knowledge. This is why I've been associated with uh, David Talbot and the comparative mythologists because that extends our knowledge right back into prehistory. And we, when you think about the short time that we've been observing the skies with modern instruments, it's a very narrow view of, our, of the history of the skies. We do not want merely a modern consensus in one single specialised field. What is plasma? Moving plasma generates electric currents and forms current sheets, filaments and bubbles. It produces radiation over large parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and this makes radio astronomy extremely important in the future. There's already sufficient information to be able to overturn, in my opinion, all of the nonsense about the Big Bang available from radio astronomical observations. Interestingly, plasma behaviour is extremely complex, far more than I ever imagined. As I say here, the flow of electricity through plasma can cause glows, arcs, jets, filaments, beads, bubbles, kinks, sausages, tornadoes and explosions. That's a pretty fair range of phenomena to be going on with, with a single mechanism. It's just as we see in the lab, and as it turns out, it's just as we see in deep space. Of course, this has been mentioned, the electric force is 10 to the 39 or 10 to the 40 times stronger than gravity. And one of the scientists who was involved with the Belikovskian story early in the piece, Dr. Earl Milton, wrote an article called The Gravitational Force is Zero, and he used this little example at the bottom. Gravitational force divided by the electric force is 10 to the minus 39, which is as good as zero as you can get. So we cannot ignore the electric force in the universe. In a plasma universe, we have to ask what physics lies behind these wonderfully mysterious objects that shine in deep space. All these glorious photographs we get from space 
are being viewed and interpreted by people who have no experience in plasma physics. It's obvious that energy has been supplied to the thin gas in space so that some atoms become ionised and glow. Astronomers are restricted to explosions to uh, deliver the energy to this ionised gas. And in some cases, the distance between the glowing envelope and the central object that's supposed to have exploded precludes the explosion being responsible for the energy that we see radiated by these uh, uh, spectacular planetary nebulae. The, so the plasma universe can be far more complex than we ever imagined, while the underlying principles are very simple. And this may be chisel, chiselled in rocks on the surrounding country, out in the surrounding countryside near Los Alamos. Christian Berkeland is one of the Electric Universe pioneers. He was a Nobel Prize nominee and a pioneer. He built a model electromagnetic Earth, his Torella experiment, to mimic an aurora. And uh, a good book about uh, his life is by Lucy Jago called The Northern Lights. It's, it's a good read. The thing is that this Torella needs electric power to work. So the phenomena we see in his experiments has to be powered electrically externally, and this is important, of course. He wrote, it seems to be a natural consequence of our points of view to assume that the whole of space is filled with electrons and flying electric ions of all kinds. He was rather prescient in his statements, there's more to come. This magnetic field, the ambient magnetic field, which you can see here, are named after him, and it is the force-free means of transferring electrical power from one part of the universe to the other. The current filaments naturally form double helix or twisted pairs at every scale from the laboratory to galaxies. And that's uh, due in part to the difference in mass of the positively charged particles that carry the current and the negative, of course, the electrons that carry the current. It's interesting how these small differences here and there account for the complexity so, in deep space, we have cosmic power lines. The electrical power <coughs> transmission lines in space are usually in dark discharge mode. In other words, they can't be seen. However, they can be traced by radio astronomers. That's why I say radio astronomy is extremely important. Birkeland currents are to be found on all scales, from the lab to the galactic cluster, and can be detected by their magnetic fields. So, like birds on a power line, we are unaware of the energy coursing past us so far. This is an experiment I did in Melbourne at the laboratories of the major telecommunications carrier with high voltage equipment. That red insulation is wrapped around a very heavy gauge copper pipe and it's connected via this rod, which I'll show you in action in a moment. It's going to close the circuit between those two conducting balls you can see there. And this is the result. It's compressed in uh, both radially and longitudinally. It came down very hot. I had to toss it around until it cooled. And here we see an example in space of the very same effect. We're looking down the barrel there of a planetary nebula. This is the, an example of the electromagnetic pinch. It's also called the Bennett pinch. And you'll see here three examples. One, the laboratory example. Uh, the Southern Crab Nebula in the centre and uh, Supernova 1987A, which is one of my favourite objects, uh, since it shows all of the phenomena that we would expect from a plasma pinch effect in space and suggests that supernovae uh, have nothing to do with an internally generated explosion in a star. Alfane had an article published in the Boston Globe, I think it was in the 60s, and it was under the heading of Alfane's Electric Universe. But one of the important statements he made was important fields of research, for example, the treatment of the state in interstellar regions, including the formation of stars, are still based on a neglect of Bennett's discovery, that's the pinch effect, more than half a century ago. Present day students in astrophysics hear nothing about it. He uh, said that in 1986. Star birth. One of the features of an intense lightning bolt is that the current can actually pinch off totally so that it forms bright beads or plasmoids. 
So beat lightning appears with a particularly powerful fork lightning. It looks like the lightning discharge channel has broken up into a string of glowing plasma beads. So last year there was a report from the Herschel Space Telescope which is looking in infrared into the birthplaces of stars. And here's a quote from the paper. A view of an incredible network of filamentary structures and features indicating a chain of near simultaneous star formation events glittering like strings of pearls deep in our galaxy. That is, in effect, bead lightning in an interstellar cloud. There was a subsequent paper which examined some of these filaments in more detail. And here's the quotes from that paper. The filaments are huge, stretching for tens of light years. And regardless of the length or density of the filament, the width is always roughly the same. That's like cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning. But the explanation of the astronomers is that all of these kinks in that are caused by exploding stars. So I asked the question, where are these exploding stars? And shouldn't there be some sort of uh, radial curvature associated with those filaments? Instead of that, it has the same kind of tortured path of lightning. And the stars form along those filaments. An important aspect of the formation of stars and of all uh, condensed bodies in the universe is this effect that occurs in a Birkel and current filament, and that is that it scavenges very efficiently widely scattered material and draws it into the central <laughs> axis of the Birkel and current filament. Now, the interesting thing is that in the standard model of the collapse of the protostar material, uh, it's all radial, and astronomers have cooked up a story whereby the final collapse of all that material is adiabatic. In other words, there's no heat escape. Because the material here is distributed along that filament, the coolest part of the matter here is along the axis. And the other very important aspect of Marklin convection is that all of the cool, low ionization potential elements, which you can see there are carbon, sulfur, iron, silicon and magnesium, all the things you need to make up a planetary core, are deposited along that filament at the axis. Of course, once you've got sufficient material along that axis, there is a tendency for it to break up into blobs or into stars. So this means that they must constitute the core matter of stars, not hydrogen. You'll notice that hydrogen and helium are on the outer rim of that uh, Birkeland filament. So this destroys any idea that stars have hydrogen cores. Another way is to find these hot spots, they call them, 0.03 light years away from Earth, because they must be within that distance, actually because further out galactic magnetic fields should deflect the particles and smear them across the sky. So here we have evidence for another of Alphane's predictions. Of course, no such sources are known to exist conventionally. I believe, this is my diagram, the electric sun has been confirmed because last year we heard stories about these energetic neutral atoms which are entering the heliosphere. This is the heliosphere. The sun's this little speck in the middle. And the current that flows in the equatorial plane of the sun, it may not be equatorial actually because these are aligned with the local magnetic field as you would expect from Birkeland current. And here are the double layers that I've drawn in here, the cosmic ray accelerators. So the Earth orbiting in here will experience cosmic rays from here and from here, which is what's been found. This discovery of energetic neutral atoms in a ribbon around the Sun, around the solar system at some unknown distance, was a complete and total surprise. There was no explanation for it. The other thing is that the particles come in, in from bright spots. Now, these columns here are actually a cylinder of Birkeland filaments. So you'll find bright spots where some of those uh, Birkeland filaments are distributed around this a cylinder. If you can imagine that's, <coughs> that's a cylinder of electric current from the local industry current. So in my opinion, we have confirmation 
of the electric sun and its connection to the interstellar circuit. Sight from a guy named Stephen Smith. It sums it up pretty good, so I'm going to read what he wrote. The electric sun theory presupposes that sunspots, flares, coronal heating, and coronal mass ejections are due to changes in the sun's galactic electrical supply. The contention is that the sun is powered externally and is not a fusion reactor. Instead, Birkeland current filaments, named after Christian Birkeland, carry electricity through the Milky Way, supplying the sun with variable power. The circuits in which Birkeland currents circulate generate magnetic fields, so their helical shape is known, since it can be seen. Plasma's behavior is driven by conditions in those circuits. Fluctuations in current flow form double layers with enormous voltages between them. This means that electric forces in double layers can be several orders of magnitude stronger than gravity. Double layers separate plasma into cells that can have different temperatures or densities. According to a recent press release, Heliophysics, using data from the Solar Dynamics Observatory and the Big Bear Solar Observatory in the San Bernardino Mountains of California, think a method for supplying some heat to the solar corona was identified in their observations. One astronomer said, we see certain kinds of solar seismic waves channeling upwards into the lower atmosphere, called the chromosphere, and from there into the corona. In the electric universe, Rather than electromagnetism acting like railroad tracks, guiding the waves as they move up through the atmosphere, plasma discharge behavior is the best model for solar activity. In seeing rotating discharge columns in profile, electric discharges in plasma form hollow tendrils. Their centers are dark where convection cells would appear darker at their edges. The fact that sunspots have darker and cooler regions means that the sun is cooler in its interior. Another way in which conventional thinking differs from electric universe proposals is that most heliophysicists see the sun as a giant amplifier, accelerating solar plasmas into space in the same way that sound waves travel through the acoustical waveguides. As mentioned, however, it is spicules rising thousands of miles up in the photosphere that carry ionized plasma with them. Since the sun is the locus of positive charge with respect to interstellar plasma, sunspots appear when electric discharges penetrate the photosphere, allowing the electric charge to flow into its depths. Electromagnetic flux tubes, sunspot filaments, expose the sun's cooler interior. The idea of kinetic heat transfer from the sun's core cannot be supported by any observations. Multiple loops and arches connect sunspots and rise up from the photosphere, penetrating the chromosphere. The chromosphere is a plasma sheath, or double layer region of the sun, where most of its electrical energy is contained. When electric charge flowing into the sun's plasma sheath increases beyond a critical threshold, it triggers sudden solar flares 
and prominence eruptions. Powerful electric fields generate secondary toroidal magnetic fields that surround the eruptions. When current grows too strong, the plasma double layer is destroyed, interrupting the charge flow and allowing stored electromagnetic energy to blast into space. Solar flares, therefore, can be thought of as solar lightning bursts. This underscores Electric Universe advocate Wal Thornhill's assertions, where he says, quote, After 100 years of neglect, an electrical model of stars is just beginning to emerge. It is an engineer's view that offers a coherent understanding of our real place in the universe and practical insights for the future exploration of space. If the sun shines as an electric light plugged in to the electric universe, the objective tests become obvious. Perhaps with real understanding of stars, we may reach childhood's end in the cosmos, end quote. And that was signed Stephen Smith, Thunderbolts Group. Surface works very analogously to the way a PNP transistor works. And we'll see that in briefly at least. Anyway, again, to state the obvious, we all probably know that the major three layers on the sun that are, are important and as you, if you come toward the sun in the order in which you see them, would be the corona, the chromosphere, and the photosphere. Now the corona is perhaps the most beautiful thing in the sky. It is this colorful. It's, those are, of course, the same colors that we see in the aurora. And why? Because it's the same thing. It is plasma in the glow mode. And it is the same sort of stuff, helium, hydrogen, mostly hydrogen, uh, excited electrically. Again, everything I say, please ask yourself, while I'm saying it, how does the, how does the standard model explain this? The standard model has no explanation for why a corona exists in the first place. If, it's a, if the sun is just a nuclear furnace, like a wood stove, my wood stove doesn't glow like that. And so, uh, clearly, everything that we observe around the surface of the sun, including the corona, is electrical in nature. Um, one other comment, and that is that um, you can't see anything in the night sky that isn't plasma. It's, oh yeah, I can see the moon. Yeah, but of course the moon is reflected sunlight. And sunlight is plasma. The sun, where all of light that we see, if you look at Jupiter through a telescope or Saturn or any of the planets, you're seeing reflected plasma light. And the, we'll talk about the photosphere and where all that light comes from in a minute. But the corona is a pretty big thing. Uh, it, it extends out about three solar radii, if you look at half the width of that disk. Uh, and then do one, two, three. It takes you out to about the corner of that picture, and you can see that's about the extent of the corona. So it's large. The, the sun is, um, what, 865,000 kilometers across, I think, something like that. The chromosphere, the second layer going in, uh, contains these spicules. And spicules, we've all heard, you know, the pines of Rome, the spicules are the fountains of, of, of the sun, <laughs> not the fountains of Rome. But anyway, uh, the, they have certain uh, characteristics. So spicules are really towering fountains of electrons that come up out of the sun and then back into the sun again immediately. If our assumption is correct, Jurgen's assumption that the sun has a positive charge, those electrons, once spewed, are very quickly brought back into the sun again. And that's what the spicules are. Uh, the photosphere is where the action is, and that's what we're going to be talking about mostly. Uh, the, uh, 
the, the photosphere consists of these things that the astronomers called photospheric granules. Uh, a more proper name for them is anode tufts. Uh, the, um, the anode tufts consist of plasma in the arc mode. And I've heard all sorts, even my, one of my good friends thinks the sun is liquid hydrogen or something. It better be pretty hot liquid because uh, plasma in the arc mode puts out a horrific amount of, of power. And as a matter of fact, uh, oh, the, oh, but I should say this, those, those granules come and go with time. They grow, they get bright, then they shrink and they go away. The, uh, the power put out by the sun is really fantastic. Um, that is to say, uh, the, the radiation from the sun, every square inch of the sun's surface on average puts out 42,000 watts. If you can think of what, what about a square mile, <laughs> That's, it's, not, it's not boiling anything. It's arc mode plasma. The, uh, the temperature of those granular, uh, granules or tufts is about 6,000 Kelvin, which is pretty, you, know, you wouldn't want to spend your summer vacation there, but it's uh, in relation to the, to the uh, temperature of the lower corona, which is 2 million Kelvin, it's a, not, it's a medium temperature. Anyway, the, uh, the, the, there's a picture of the granules. That's a movie. If you look at it very carefully, you can see it moving. It's a real-time motion picture of the granules. If you keep your eye on one, especially near the... I think that white stuff in the center is a bunch of spicules coming up through... I don't know, but I think that's what it is. And you see them. They're, uh, they're all over the place. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, where is it? There's some down here, there's some over here, up here, and of course a bunch of them here. If you keep your eyes on the, um, the, uh, um, the granules themselves, you'll see them shrinking away to nothing. And the question is, why do they do that? Well, there's a typical sunspot. And you might say, well, what's a sunspot? Well, sunspots where the photospheric tufts are not. It's a region where the, the photospheric tufts don't exist. And so there's been a, a good deal of work done in the laboratory on uh, anode tufts. And uh, we'll talk some about that. The, uh, the main... Uh, focus, uh, I would say, of Jurgen's sun model is an anode tuft. How does the anode tuft work? And that's one of the things I'd like to spend some time on this morning. There is, of course, the penumbra. That's that orange ring that you can see. The dark inner area is called the umbra. And the temperatures in the umbra have been measured at, well, just something north of 3,000 Kelvin. So the umbra, obviously, is much cooler than the uh, normal uh, spots. The, I'm sorry, the normal uh, tufts, which are the, the yellow region around the outside there. Anyway, um, I said that Monty had sent me some interesting pictures from, uh, from Sapphire. There is one. Now, the, the purple wine glass in the back is not real. Monty has not been drinking. Uh, that's just an aberration of the photograph. This was taken inside a bell jar. And he has managed, he and his team, have managed to actually create anode tufts. The center pur bright purple thing is a spherical, although it's distorted some by the, by the shape of the bell jar. It's pretty spherical, and it's the anode. And riding on top of that anode are anode tufts. And so um, the major property of these anode tufts is that they're made up of positive charges. And as such, you can think to yourself, just basic knowledge of electricity, if those things are each one a group of positive charges, then they don't like each other. They're going to be repelling each other. And so you see they're quite evenly spaced over the surface of the sphere. And as you'll see in a minute, uh, when Mahdi increases the current, 
He increases the number of tufts and he increases the brightness of the tufts and finally they turn into something in the arc mode just like we see on the surface of the sun. So, the, as I said before, I think I said before, the, um, <clears throat> the main basis of the, um, of the Jurgen's model is an analysis of those tufts. And so we're going to be thinking of traveling in a line, if you can visualize from the purple surface there, the surface of the anode, up through the tuft and then out beyond the tuft. And let's think what, what would we expect to see there. I'll tell you what Jurgen's expected to see there, and I think it's exactly what Monty is seeing and is going to see in his sapphire experiment. That's the famous double layer. You're going to hear people in here talk about double layers. Um, Hannes Alfian was famous for double layers. Uh, um, uh, Irving Langmuir got the Nobel Prize for his work with double layers. That's a double layer. That's all it is. That is what it is. Why don't those positive charges and negative charges come together and neutralize each other? Why do they stay separate? Irving Langmuir <laughs> found out, and that's why he got the Nobel Prize. And I've heard people decry that that can't happen. This, uh, what you're seeing, you don't, don't believe your, your lying eyes. Believe me, I'm going to tell you what happened. No, that's what really happens. And that's a picture of what the penumbral filaments look like. And it's kind of interesting that uh, I maintain, and you think of it yourself, the umbra is a place where there aren't any, any tufts. So if you look at a cross section of this thing, you can see tufts, 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 tufts. They're all pushing on each other. You know, the samurai warriors, they don't like each other. And, but when it comes to the edge of the place where there aren't any tufts, these guys don't have anything to hold them back. So pfft, they fall in. And you can see that's happening. The reason I say you can see it happening is concentrate on the, on the circular ring right on the outside of the penumbra, right between the yellow and the, what is it, ochre colored uh, areas. And you can see that the regular tufts, the yellow area, right near where the tufts are breaking away are going outward. You see that? And the tufts in the penumbra are going inward. Sure, they hate each other. They're both positive groups of positive charge. They're elbowing each other. And so when the group that is not being held back by anything and just falls off, when it starts to flow, to, to move, it's still pushing on the other guys. The space is opening up. And so some fall in and some fall away. So there's a, I think that that is proof, the fact that the yellow ones actually move outward while the other ones are moving inward. When space opens up for them to be able to move, shows that you're seeing, what you're seeing is an electric reaction. It's not a gravitational reaction. At least I maintain it, it's not. The analogy, of course, is the uh, calving of, al of icebergs. You get a glacier, and you get the ocean or wherever that water is out there, and these things eventually break loose and fall in. In this case, this guy that's falling in, in the process of falling in is not pushing on anything. So there's no tendency for the tufts, if you will, the potential icebergs that are in the wall of the glacier, there's no tendency for them to move away because nothing's pushing on them. Only gravity is pulling the one down that's falling in. This is not the case, so this is a partial analogy. It is sort of like, it lets you think about what is happening on the sun, but on the sun, this guy that's falling is pushing back like crazy on the one that he just came away from, and he's moving back. It's going to increase in strength, and the plasma tufts are going to go into the arc mode. You will see the photosphere. There they are. They don't like each other. It's like a bunch of kabuki warriors pushing each other away. They're, they're all positive. 
and they're all looking for advantage and not finding it. You might hear Monty's voice in the background if they have the, the audio on. There's, he's, he's increased the current. The tufts have begun to go into this. I know whether it's a, a high glow mode or that's arc mode. You can see now, it's a better model that you can see the sunspots. Sunspo sunspots are where there are no tufts. There's something that he's got the excitation such that it looks like the chromosphere. That little black thing in the, in the bottom, I guess, Michael can tell me whether, is that the, the spectroscopic probe or it's a probe of some sort? There's the corona. The ring around the outside is the cathode. And of course, in the model, in the pressure. sapphire model, you need a cathode. But in real space, of course, there is the cathode is a virtual cathode. But there's the, uh, the corona. The, re the reason that the corona there looks like it's only on one side is because the, um, the anode is closer to the cathode on that spot where you get the corona. If, if it were equally spaced, you'd see the corona all the way around. Sorry for the hokey uh, ending. Uh, in modern cosmology with uh, the medieval church, I think we've suffered through the last century the demise of physics. I've recently come to the position that Stephen Hawking was right. Philosophy is dead. Ever since Kant claimed that the world we observe is all in the mind. Because following Kant and Einstein, modern physics has followed that same path. And it's also dead but won't lie down. <laughs> I've recently read this book by David Harriman, I think his name is, called The Logical Leap, and it's about induction in physics. And he says, the only means of knowledge is reasoning from observed facts, and that's been the story for me. The senses provide our only direct contact with reality. He goes on to say that induction is much more difficult and controversial than deduction, and why it is not reducible to the formalism of symbols, and that's particularly true on the path that I've taken. Deduction takes for granted the process of conceptualization. Induction is the conceptualization process itself in action. David Harriman goes on to say that a conceptual consciousness is an integrating mechanism and its product, knowledge, is an interconnected system, not a heap of propositions, which is largely how science is at present. And here's the man who taught me. I came across his book before I entered university. I was inspired by it, the approach, the logical leaps that uh, Velikovsky took, I had never seen before. When I got to university, I spent a lot of time in the sociology shelves at the university library, just picking books at random about myths and legends from around the world. And I found that the stories were understandable. They tended to leap off the page at me and I could see how they related to what Belikovsky had uh, shown in his work. I believed that he had made a case that needed to be answered. One of the things he did do as well was to throw down the gauntlet to astronomers by saying that uh, electromagnetism was involved in the celestial mechanism. But this was ignored by astronomers who simply said his work disobeys Newton's laws and therefore we can ignore you. They never picked up the gauntlet. In my view, cosmology must be a coherent natural philosophy and there can be no exceptions. If there's an exception, there's a problem with your cosmology. At present, the Big Bang doesn't address all any of the big issues, in my opinion. I consider it a hopeless cosmology. It must provide insights into every discipline, including life itself and the human condition. And I think this is extremely important and something that Velikovsky felt also was important for our long-term survival. However, modern specialised science is a hostile environment for such a quest. Now, we do have a, an alternative cosmology that is accepted by the IEEE, the largest professional organisation in the world. It is based on the work of several Nobel Prize winners over the last century, has many successful predictions to its name, and also challenges the Big Bang. This is why astronomers ignore it. However, it doesn't handle unsolved problems in basic, particle and stellar physics. And this is the area that the electric universe tries to address. 
and tries to tackle these fundamental problems and in doing so offers a breakthrough in understanding of ourselves and our place in the universe. The electric universe, I believe, is an attempt at a convergent interdisciplinary cosmology. And the first thing to do is to get rid of some of the perpetrators of the demise of physics. In my view, science left the path of reason and objectivity in the early 1900s, and I'm sure I won't get much argument from the audience having sat through very many very interesting talks at this conference. Einstein and his proponents bequeathed us, in my view, a disconnected, incoherent universe that simply cannot function or give rise to life. And this is why so much magic has had to be invoked to try and make the theory fit the facts. And if the facts don't fit the theory, you can ignore them. Don Hodson, who I believe is a member of the NPA, has said everyone who takes relativity seriously believes in the reality of at least one direction in which one cannot point. And I thought that was a very succinct way of putting it. <laughs> I also believe that E equals MC squared, whether you attribute it to Einstein or anyone else, is the best known and most misunderstood equation in science. In my view, the real meaning of E equals MC squared is that energy, mass, and the speed of light are all properties of matter. Electromagnetic energy, in my view, is stored in the orbital substructure of subatomic particles and manifests as their mass. The orbital substructure picture was given to me by Ralph Sansbury back in uh, about 1981. Therefore, the mass of a particle is a measure of how much energy is absorbed in deformation of a particle instead of its acceleration. This is an alternative way of looking at the particle accelerating experiments. So standard model does not challenge the basic assumption. I have a few more things to add to that, but not much. The sun is a variable star in x-rays, meaning there is no way to find out how long it will continue to shine, as it does, but there appears to be a mechanism in place that maintains its brightness and electrical output in spite of its varying electrical environment. Plasma operates in what is called dark mode in many cases. But it, unlike dark matter or energy, can be detected by radio telescopes. Plasma is significantly defined as the fourth state of matter. But it is only because it was the last to be discovered. In actuality, it is the first state of matter. Plasma was termed by Irving Langmuir, who won the Nobel Prize. And he named it plasma because it reminded him of blood plasma and seemed alive. An example of plasma would be a fluorescent light or a flame, which needs some kind of starter to get it going. Then there's normal glow mode. There is another mode called arc mode, like in welding, which again needs to be started with an electrical difference, which drops when it begins to operate. At that point, the air breaks down to become a conductive plasma. And this thing called the pinch effect. It has been reproduced in laboratories because the beauty of the electric universe is that the plasma operates the same in tiny experiments or galactic interactions. The pinch effect of the electric current is what forms galaxies and also within those galaxies create the stars. The pinch effect is powering the galaxy and then down to the stars and then actually power the stars themselves with these things called anode tufts. While Thornhill has made an analogy that seen from space one might think that a bright city would be powered from within but actually it is being powered by invisible lines from power stations sometimes hundreds of miles away. The sun works on this premise. Now the solar wind as it recedes from the sun accelerates and it is actually an electric current and not a wind. 
so it has been misnamed. But there is also a problem with the standard models missing neutrinos. As it is known, when you combine four hydrogen atoms in a nuclear reaction, they have to get what is called a neutrino. So there must be all of these neutrinos coming from the sun, but they're not finding them anywhere near the amount they need, which should be being generated at the core. compressed matter in the core of the Sun to cause its thermal temperature to be around 15 million degrees and that it's this pressure that is responsible for the nuclear reactions causing fusion and that through various ways this energy migrates and finally escapes through the layers of the Sun creating the photosphere which is cooler at about 6,000 degrees Celsius. And then further on out to the corona, where the temperature again rises up to around 2 million degrees. But this is one of many disparities that heliophysicists have spent years working on to discover why does the sun shine? Three, if you would. It's almost done. Yeah, I discharged the stem, but it's fine. So we have these uh, anodes we can throw out. And that was day two. So we thought that was pretty cool too. We thought, okay, we've got some good news and now we can go to the conference. And then... The spicules of the sun have to be investigated from a new vantage point, and so much of this has to do with the interfacial dynamics of different plasma regions and charged particles being launched into higher regions and so on. And um, both Don Scott and uh, Wall Thornhill place a great emphasis on the study of the spicule dynamics. Solar electrical effects. The sun's surface is carpeted with complex magnetic fields. Only electricity can produce magnetic fields, therefore the sun must be understood in terms of electric circuits. Where are these circuits and what creates them? And what sustains them? Uh, plasma physicists know that the uh, movement of different types of plasma past one another will generate currents in the plasma. When you get back to first causes, we do not know. We don't even know the right questions to ask at this stage of our ignorance, I would uh, suggest. Sunspots are an embarrassment in the thermonuclear model. They have powerful magnetic fields with the same polarity spots clumped together. Now, normally the same polarity magnetic fields push one another apart. However, the magnetic field here is a signature of the Birkeland currents piercing the photosphere. And the pinch effect means the magnetic field is very intense in sunspots. They are drawn together because parallel currents attract it's as simple as that. Ampere's law. Their darkness, structure and behaviour have required great ingenuity in attempts to explain them, yet they remain mysterious. I asked the question, does this sunspot penumbra, this is where you can see edge on to the photosphere and look deeper into the atmosphere, or the ionosphere I should say, of the sun. And I asked this question, does this sunspot penumbra look like turbulent boiling hot gas? And I would say not. It has structure, it has a motion which doesn't look like boiling material coming up from the interior of the sun. And why is the sunspot dark if the sun is hotter beneath? It should be blindingly bright because we're trying to get that 15 million degrees energy out through this hole which is looking deeper into the ionosphere of the sun. The simplest answer is that the sun is thousands of degrees cooler below. And remember I said stars are formed with cool cores? They're not formed with hot cores. They could never have any nuclear reactions in their core under those conditions. Here we come back to Birkeland. This man was amazing. He wrote, it might be imagined that the interior of the sun formed a positive pole for enormous electric currents. So there's your electric sun. 
This assumption has the advantage of appearing to give a natural explanation of the movement of the sunspots in various latitudes. This experiment has been repeated uh, back in the 60s, and depending on the uh, current input, those spots move in latitude, which is exactly what we see. So the uh, sunspot movement across uh, the latitudes on the sun is a measure of the changing input to the power input to the sun. <coughs> In this case, he wrote, the origin of the sunspots must be that the presumptive more or less insulating photospheric envelope was sometimes pierced by disruptive discharges. I couldn't believe it when I read that. Thus forming great electric arcs. I would say he was the first one to actually tell you what a sunspot is. And that was from his uh, huge tomes called the Norwegian Aurora Polaris Expedition published in 1902-1903. What do we find today? This is the sun in an ultraviolet light and you can see that we have an equatorial view at the top and a polar view at the bottom. And it has a plasma torus about it. And this is exactly what Birkeland had found in his experiments. That you get a plasma torus and it's a storage ring. It stores energy. When that energy gets to a certain level, a massive discharge will take place from that torus to the surface of the body and it follows the magnetic field lines. In the extreme case, when there's too much energy in that ring, it may actually switch to a polar jet. Many stars have polar jets. I suggest that these long filaments in the penumbra are actually electrical tornadoes thousands of kilometres long. They have bright edges, dark cores and a twisted appearance. And there's a, a special effects fire here with a helicopter engine above and uh, fire is injected at the bottom and you can see the, the bright edges here and the dark core and you can see these filaments here, it's exactly what they've got. And bright lightning flecks the tops of the granules, these are the solar granules that we see covering the sun. So the sunspot cycle you see the sun in x-rays and it is a variable star. It almost winks out at solar minimum and at solar maximum it is much brighter. And x-rays are a direct measure of electrical activity. The sun is connected to a galactic circuit which is subject to quasi-cyclical change so that the origin of the sunspot cycle is beyond the solar system. It may be due to alphane waves and the Birkeland currents that feed the solar system, or it could be due to the actual motion and rotary motion of the Birkeland currents past the heliosphere. Seen in x-rays, the sun is a variable star, and yet the heat and light from the sun is constant to within a tenth of one percent. An explanation is very important for it explains why most bright stars shine steadily. And it's not like the 4th of July. An electric sun, this is something that Don Scott pointed out because he's an electrical engineer and knows this stuff inside out. He said this voltage curve here across the photospheric tufts, those long filaments that we saw a moment ago, is that of a PNP transistor. In other words, this tufted sheath of our sun forms a barrier for protons escaping the sun because those protons trying to escape the sun have to climb this barrier here before they can go down this waterfall and excite the corona to its tens of millions of degrees temperatures. And beyond here, there's a slight electrical field, just enough to accelerate the solar wind the way we see it. Of course, this then is a regulating mechanism because just a small shift in voltage up and down here is enough to modulate the power output that passes through these tufts. And that is the regulating mechanism for all bright stars that have a photosphere. That's why they shine steadily in the night sky. There is no regulating mechanism for a thermonuclear model star. In fact, they're the most unstable things you could imagine because some of the reactions uh, vary with uh, temperature to the fifth power. Here are these strange things called spicules, and Ralph Jurgens didn't shrink from trying to explain these as well. And it turns out that to maintain a steady discharge through that tufted sheath, there has to be a balance between the number of electrons travelling in one direction and the number of positive ions going in the other. 
and these spicules actually provide the material to be ionised in the chromosphere and maintain a steady discharge. There's an analogue in some arc lamps, the kinds of things used in searchlights, they had porous anodes to actually produce this steady arc. Don Scott, this is his diagram from his book, uh, The Electric Sky. It's the solar transformer. The greatest puzzle of the sun, its magnetic field reversals, is solved. The sun has magnetic fields induced by a varying DC power input and so acts like a power transformer with an impressed DC current as well. So all you've got is a varying DC current which is driving the sun. Remarkably, once again, here he is, Christian Berkelin proposed that solar magnetism was caused by electric currents induced in the conductive interior of the sun. Hey presto. He should have got a Nobel Prize, several of them. <laughs> solar neutrinos match the no thermonuclear engine inside the sun. It's not important, but it's just one of the questions that arise. Neutrinos produced in the dense photospheric plasma, because these are pinches, is where the nuclear synthesis takes place. So stars produce their own heavy elements. You don't have to have supernova explosions to do it. A supernova explosion actually distributes the material that the star has already formed. A neutrino count falls when the sunspots reduce the photospheric area. So the higher the number of sunspots, the lower the number of neutrinos, which is what you'd expect if this uh, second point is correct. So we need not assume a change in flavour of neutrinos, whatever that means. In other words, a change in resonance state of the neutrino en route from the solar core because the reactions in those plasma filaments is much more complex than the standard hydrogen to hydrogen uh, chain reaction uh, would uh, provide. Now, Stellar and planetary structure and composition are based upon the erroneous conviction that Newtonian big G is a universal constant. So when I say that this sun has a heavy element core, of course the helioseismologists would say, but, but, you know, our models show that it hasn't. But they're basing their model on a completely erroneous idea about the amount of matter in our star or any celestial body. If Big G is a variable dependent upon the electrical state or the electrical tension in a body like the sun, then we cannot say what it's made of. We have no way of knowing except by observing material that comes from it. And if the sun is cool, there is a radial internal electric field to be considered because, uh, as I said before, all the positive charges are heavier than the negative charges. So in a gravitational field, there would be an offset and a radial electric field, so all celestial bodies behave like electrets. These internal electric fields can actually uh, respond to disturbances and cause the ejection of large quantities of core material. In other words, form planets and moons and so on. The electric sun has a completely different picture. Here we have a cool core. We have an extensive atmosphere and an ionosphere at the top, and at the very top of that ionosphere is this global lightning or electrical tornado system, packed cheek by jowl. Then, ab then above that you have the energy flow, and of course it's normal to expect that incoming electrical energy will excite the plasma out here first, and then as it gets into the more dense atmosphere, it will exhibit discharge activity. Out here it's a coronal globe. In here it's normal electric arc phenomena. So the energy to heat the electric sun comes externally from the galaxy. The electric discharge becomes intense close to the sun, heating the thin atmosphere of the corona to millions of degrees. And the superheated corona is a familiar glow discharge phenomenon recognized by high voltage engineers. Now we come to the HR diagram. It's based on observations, it's not based on theory. It's a scatter plot, not an evolutionary plot, and the luminosity and colour of a star depends on its size and the current density at its radiating surface. Discontinuities exist. You've got uh, white dwarfs over here, red giants here, and red and brown dwarfs, which uh, are all discontinuous with the main sequence. These are all stars with bright photospheres. So they have that regulating uh, mechanism. 
Of course, the astronomer has got to back the front. If you do a mirror image, then you have a more uh, understandable arrangement where the stars get brighter and bluer uh, as you increase the current density so that you get this straight line curve, which is exactly what you'd expect. Red stars have to expand. That's both red dwarfs and red giants. They're stars which are not collecting enough electricity to satisfy the discharge, so the plasma adjusts. It's like a living thing almost. It adjusts to its environment. And so it expands the anode sheath to collect enough current. And some of those anode sheaths are, are monstrous. You know, beetle goose, if um, that star was in our solar system, its photosphere reaches out to the orbit of Jupiter. White dwarfs, on the other hand, may be a normal sized star, but they have no bright photosphere. Their upper atmosphere is in direct contact with the plasma of space. They have only a faint white corona. Imagine if the sun's photosphere turned off, you would see this white envelope, very faint, but very white, very high temperature in appearance. So stellar evolution is a fairy story. This is uh, V838 Monocerotus. This erupting star transformed itself over a period of months from a small under luminous star, a little hotter than the sun, to a highly luminous cooled supergiant star undergoing rapid and complex brightness changes. This was the quote of the article describing it. The transformation defies the conventional understanding of stellar life cycles. It's a very complex story. I've been through it, the theory of it. So here's a red giant. This is actually Betelgeuse. It's 500 times the size of the sun, and it has a hotspot. You've got to ask yourself, you know, what, what's a hotspot doing on a, a red giant star? What happens is as that um, envelope expands, the electric field grows stronger because it's trying to collect electrons from space. But on the other hand, positively charged particles, in other words, it's still a wind, are accelerated more strongly the other way. So you have this anomaly where these cool stars have the most powerful winds known. And if the stellar wind is being boiled off, so to speak, this doesn't make any sense at all. And Betelgeuse sports a hot spot. Now, I've suggested it may be above one of its holes because one of the Alphane circuits it shows that one of the connections of the electric circuit is to the poles of the star. So we may be staring at one of the poles. Giants and dwarfs. The usual story is that stars consume their fuel and change to giants or dwarfs. The story is complex, unverifiable and regularly contradicted. This is another version of the HR diagram there. And astronomers are perpetually astonished by unexpected changes in stars. This is a white dwarf system. Sirius B is the white dwarf. And Sirius A, you'll see an optical light here. Sirius A is very bright in the sky, and Sirius B is almost invisible. And it's a faint white, so-called white dwarf. Now, if you look at it in X-rays, it's the reverse. Here's Sirius B, it's brighter than its optically bright uh, partner, Sirius A. This is what you'd expect, where the discharge reaches into the ionosphere directly of a star. The X-ray output is high, the visual light output is low. There's nothing special about that. It can be an ordinary star. It's just that its partner may have usurped most of the current. It's supposed to be a collapsed star at the end of its fuel. But how can an old and a young star be together? Because here you have an old and a young star, so to speak, under the conventional ideas, together. A white dwarf has no bright photosphere. Its white light and x-rays come from an intense corona. Here's the different star types, and I've shown how I think they would look. A red dwarf is actually quite large. In other words, it's, it's like a red giant in miniature. A red dwarf was discovered, and the astronomers decided that it was putting out too much light for what they assumed was a dwarf star. So they said, oh, it must be a pair of red dwarfs of exactly the same size and power output. I suggested, no, it's a single red dwarf. It's just much bigger than anyone ever expected. Main sequence star, it is covered with photospheric tufting, tufted anode and a control discharge. Blue giants are a large star under high electrical stress. 
red giants are a normal star under low electrical stress and it develops a bloated glowing plasma sheath. A white dwarf is a normal star in direct contact with space plasma and has low luminosity. Talking about brown dwarfs, if a brown dwarf gets close to a very bright star, the bright star is at a higher potential than the brown dwarf, that brown dwarf will actually switch off as a star and become a comet. It switches from being an anode in the uh, discharge system to being a cathode, and there are quite distinct differences. Now, if the Earth, hypothetically here, if the Earth was a satellite of a brown dwarf, that radiating shell would be quite enormous. It could have all of the satellites of that object, that small star, orbiting within that envelope. That whole radiating envelope puts energy on the surface of any orbiting planet equally on every square metre. So that you would have no seasons, no day and night, and you'd receive ultraviolet light. This is, it refers to what Dwyer was talking about the other day with the earliest memories of mankind. It suggests that we were in this situation, and astronomers in recent years have come to the conclusion that this is the more likely place for life to thrive. Where we are now is much more precarious. So brown dwarfs don't hang out with stars because electrically it's impossible. The other thing is that uh, these brown dwarfs, unexpectedly, they flare. They throw material off occasionally because they've got no means of controlling their discharge other than to get rid of material, matter, charged matter. So that any satellites of these brown dwarfs gets occasionally drowned in water and atmosphere and also uh, solid materials to cause layering on them. Brown dwarfs flare and deposit layered minerals on their satellites. There's a few more logical leaps involved in the electric universe, and I'll just go through a few of them. I ask the question, is gravity a weak electric dipole to dipole force between distorted subatomic particles? And this refers to something that Velikovsky said to me when I visited him, and also to Ralph Sansbury's view that uh, all subatomic particles have an orbital structure, a resonant orbital structure. And as Ralph has pointed out, magnetism then is also an electric dipole to dipole force due to transverse distortion of electrons and protons accelerated in an electric field. If so, the electric force is the only force necessary in physics, and this goes back to the way classical physics operated by trying to reduce the number of forces and ideas. And quantum effects imply that all matter has a resonant electrical substructure. Information and energy can be stored and transferred via these matter resonances, and that has uh, significance in biological systems too. So astrophysical and biological coherence requires universal, near instantaneous electrical interactions. All of the so-called spooky quantum things uh, are no longer spooky if we accept this, this idea. We have a return of the ether. We must have uh, particles to be able to transfer the energy and the forces through so-called empty space. Empty space, I suggest, is full of neutrinos. The neutrinos are the lowest energy state of matter. They exhibit vanishingly small mass. They're composed of subtrons, uh, which is what Ralph called them. They form electric dipoles, that is the neutrinos, in an electric field. And each dipole rotates in the electromagnetic field of a light wave. That ties the speed of light in a vacuum to the moment of inertia of a neutrino. And neutrinos may reintroduce cause and effect to radioactive decay. At present, it's a purely statistical phenomenon. The other thing is that it also solves the difficulty of the so-called annihilation of, and creation of matter in particle accelerators. You cannot do it. But if the neutrinos are the substrate, they can accept energy and become a particle and its mirror particle. I don't use the word antiparticle because there's no such thing. It's all matter, normal matter. I put these few slides on the end because there was discussion about Venus and the transfer of charge and I think it's important because it returns Velikovsky's gauntlet to him cordially. Velikovsky argued that planets change orbits, exchange thunderbolts and quickly settle into peaceful orbits. Now rapid settling after chaos defies Newton's laws, which of course that was uh, the argument levelled against Velikovsky, which for more than a two-body gravitational system are chaotic anyway, so the astronomers have yet to explain why we have a stable solar system. So astronomers simply ignored the gauntlet flung down by Velikovsky. 
Then we have Anthony Pratt and the convergence of his work with ours uh, some few years ago. And he showed globally, petroglyphs show to a high degree of confidence that within human existence the Earth has suffered stupendous electric discharge phenomena from the heavens. And that's a picture of one of his uh, papers. Now, if we accept Velikovsky's gauntlet, we need to look at Newton's law of gravity again and, and just have a think about what it really means. You'll notice there that G, I put its dimensions there just to show that it does include mass. And if mass is a variable, then uh, we have a problem. It is simply assumed that G is the same for all bodies in the universe. In other words, the universal gravitational constant. And that was an assumption. Stellar and planetary structure and composition is based upon this premise. But if mass is a variable, can it explain cosmic pool? The book over there is uh, by one of the Thunderbolts team, C.J. Ransom, The Age of Velikovsky. Of course, MOND is the latest buzzword in gravity theory, the modified Newton's dynamics. I've suggested that we can have electrically modified Newtonian dynamics. And I won't go through all that business there. You can see it on my website and so on. But the upshot is that uh, the radius of the orbit of a planet is proportional to the mass of the planet if you keep the orbital energy constant and you assume the sun's g is constant, and I think that's a fair assumption. If the mass doubles, the orbital radius must double to conserve orbital energy. Now, I said earlier that all planets and stars and all celestial objects will form an electret. In other words, you have positive poles facing inwards and negative poles facing outwards. So it sets up an internal electric field. The planet acts like an electret. And any free electrons would tend to drift towards the surface. Like a subatomic particle under the stress of an electric field, the internal electrical stress modifies the apparent mass of the planet or star, and therefore its gravity. Exchanging charge at the surface through lightning, etc., changes the mass or gravity of a planet. And there is evidence for that. Coronal mass ejections, large ones which strike the Earth, actually change the rate of spin of the Earth suddenly, and then it decays back to its original speed, which is diagnostic of a change of the moment of inertia of the Earth by some means which hasn't been explained. Comet accelerations also. Cometry displays are an obvious electric discharge phenomenon. Anybody on an eccentric orbit about the Sun will experience discharge activity. The discharge will cause apparent non-Newtonian acceleration, and this is well known uh, with comets. They're very hard to predict their precise return because of them. And this is because the mass of the comet is changing, something that's not taken into any account. However, gravity is still the operative force, but here we have a feedback mechanism which can modify orbits. So, changing planetary mass. The closer the encounter between two planets, and the more powerful the charge exchange between planets, the greater the orbital adjustments. It seems an efficient mechanism for collision avoidance and spacing the planetary orbits apart, which may explain one of the reasons why we survived Velikovsky's uh, catastrophic scenario. The inner planet reduces its charge polarization, its mass, and the outer planet increases its polarization mass in the exchange. And I ask the question, is this possible? Yes. I believe it is, because some years ago it was reported that a spacecraft here, the SOHO spacecraft, picked up stringy things, stringy plasma things, arriving from Venus when it was between us and the Sun. Now those stringy things, of course, are recognised immediately as Birkeland currents, and the Birkeland currents transfer electrons from Venus to the Earth. At present it has little or no effect on the Earth because of the distance and the low current density. So there's an intermittent circuit for transferring electrons from the inner planet to the outer when they're aligned with the sun. The charge transfer is in the correct sense to induce the planets to move apart into orbits having electrical least interaction. Quickly it will appear as though the system operates according to Newton's laws with no sign of recent instability. And that was the problem that Velikovsky faced and it was the question I asked him when I visited him. How do we deal with this problem? And I think this is the answer, or part of the answer. And we come to the Sanyak Award winner, and I consider a great man, a modern Galileo. Dr. Halton Arp embraces a plasma universe. <laughs> I think it's a very apt photograph. 
Also, I might say there are a lot of interesting issues raised by Haltenhoff's discoveries that fit neatly in Electric Universe solution. For example, intrinsic quantized redshift and an increase of mass with time were explained by an electrical origin for particle masses and their resonant quantized states. Because the quasars are ejected from a galaxy, the electrons are tangled up in the plasmoid at the centre of a galaxy for far longer than the neutrons, which can escape because they're uncharged, and the protons, which are heavier. So that quasars are electron deficient initially, which means that all of their energy levels of all their matter will function at a lower level. Their fine structure constant will be different. Their um, redshift uh, spectrum will be enhanced. But over time, as the electrons stream out in those great jets that we see, both the mass increases, but it does so in resonant steps, quantized steps, and the brightness increases because the electrical energy arriving is increasing. And so this explains this very strange phenomenon where a quasar ejected at very high speeds from the centre of an active galaxy can actually slow down and go into orbit about its parent. So this is the quasar mass gain. You can see this is one of ARP's diagrams of the birth and the development of quasars into companion galaxies. Intrinsic redshift, an increase in mass of subatomic particles equals an increase in the orbital energies of electrons within atoms in the quasar. That results in a decrease in redshift of the quasar. And since subatomic particles are resonant systems of charge, the redshift must decrease in quantum jumps. Now any explanation for this kind of intrinsic redshift gets over the problems that you face if you try to talk about the medium between us and the quasar because you cannot quantize, as far as I can imagine, the redshift by anything that occurs between us and the emitting object, but it's intrinsic to the emitting object. He called the scientific establishment rose in arms not only against the new Velikovsky theories, but against the man himself. Efforts were made to block the dissemination of Dr. Velikovsky's ideas and to even punish supporters of his investigations. Universities, scientific societies, publishing houses, and popular press were approached and threatened. Social pressures and professional sanctions were invoked to control public opinion. There can be little doubt that in a totalitarian society, not only would Dr. Velikovsky's reputation have been at stake, but also his right to pursue his inquiry and perhaps even his personal affairs. And that's absolutely factual. And one of the major scientists that was put on to the case of Velikovsky to uh, totally uh, tried to refute all of his theories was none other than Carl Sagan. That was Carl Sagan's uh, evening job, if you will, was to go around and harass and try to refute all the theories of, of Emanuel Velikovsky, and he was not able to refute any of them. Alfred A. Wallace, no less the co-founder, who discovered natural selection previous to Darwin, and with him was the founder of the evolutionist theory. But on reviewing the startling differences between Homo sapiens and other mammals, he realized that man was an exception to the rules of evolution. He amazingly wrote, some intelligent power has guided or determined the development of man. There are so many things that mainstream science does not know. For example, they don't know what gravity is. They can't define it. What makes that happen? What is it that makes the earth spin? What is it that holds thousands of tons of water in the clouds before a rainstorm? It should just pass right through it. Why is the surface of the earth negatively charged? Why is it that negative ions are healthy? These fundamental questions, modern mainstream science just doesn't even really bother to know the answers. They just avoid the question or accuse you of being a conspiracy theorist for even asking. And by the way, this is called gravity. 
The electric universe is a very broad, high altitude perspective. One has to really put aside all of the dogma and teachings that have been pounded in them since childhood in order to take a true unbiased look into things. And science needs to become less of a religion and more of a science. You know, uniformitarianism, I think, is the great lie that every single academic science builds its theories on. How could a little river cause the Grand Canyon? And if it did, then where is all the sediment that was carried away? It would have to go somewhere. It couldn't just disappear. You know, the electric universe has an answer for that, too. Also, did you know electricity can immediately cause fossils? One thing they never talk about is that dinosaurs could not have lived in today's gravity. The origin of our solar system and the purple dawn of creation will be in our next episode. So I hope you join me for that one. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you. The web of circuitry and the electric force connects and unifies all of nature, organizing galaxies, energizing stars, giving birth to planets, and on our own world, controlling weather and animating biological organisms. In other words, there are no isolated islands in space. Thank you.
Michael Elner says. Okay. Is a supernova. And uh, I'm going to play this video by Mr. Thornhill and another one after it by Mr. Talbot. And then I'm going to give some closing thoughts and we can move on from the sun. But I strongly recommend watching the videos that are attached down in the description because you can't get the full story from me. I'm just trying to point it out the connection between the past. watch anything in ancient history this puts it in a completely different context and you know about everything that has gone down the way that I think it has through the electric universe and the purple dawn of creation it paints a completely different picture I know it's in a show
in an old elliptical galaxy in a region where there are no stars being born. So this raises some questions at the end of the article. It says, is this a runaway star from another star formation site? Is it a very local bit of star formation? Is it a different way for such a supernova to occur? None of these seems very likely, so we have a real puzzle. Well, the problem stems from the theory of stars themselves. In fact, the models of stars are so complex that they are non-predictive. One wag suggested you could just as easily come up with a koala bear as a star from the complexity of the theory. The other thing is that a supernova explosion is not really understood. It's a very clever model, but it's totally beyond belief. You have a star which suddenly switches off a theoretical engine at the centre, its nuclear furnace, and it suddenly implodes. So this requires the uh, switch off to be sudden. And not only that, the implosion then has to rebound to form the explosion. Of course, this kind of model, you would expect, would form a spherical shell of material racing away from the star. But what do we see when we look at supernovae? Generally, they have an axis along which matter is ejected. So it's not spherical, the explosion. So this is another puzzle. In fact, it was June last year, it was reported that supercomputer models of supernovae failed to explode. All they did was to implode and collapse. So it's not surprising that astronomers are puzzled. This particular supernova shows a high degree of helium, which also is unexpected. So it was even suggested that perhaps this particular supernova was another type, which is due to white dwarfs exceeding a certain mass and then exploding. And so they said maybe it was a collision of two white dwarfs, one of which was helium rich. So you can see these special conditions that are being introduced in order to try and explain this supernova. Now, it's just a couple of years ago that I had published in the IEEE Transactions on Plasma Science my explanation of supernova 1987A, which shows structure. It showed three rings which were centred on an axis through the star, and these rings were made of bright beads. The one nearest the star, encircling where the star was, were very bright, and those further away were dimmer. But this kind of structure is just not explained by any theory of an exploding star. Much of the strange and encumbered reasoning behind the standard supernova theory may be resolved if a supernova is reinterpreted as an electrical discharge. In the electric universe model of stars, the complex chemistry to produce the heavy elements inside the star is unnecessary in a supernova. The idea is, of course, that there are populations of stars, and the first population of stars exploded and threw all of the heavier elements out into space where they were collected to make the second population of stars. Now, this is a very messy and inefficient way of producing the stars that we see in our own galaxy, for instance. Also, wherever you look, astronomers are finding anomalies in chemical compositions of stars, stars that shouldn't be there, that they're the wrong age, the wrong population. Recently, looking at globular clusters, they've been puzzled by the chemical composition of those stars because it was thought they must have all been produced at the same time in the same event, and yet they're finding compositions which don't fit that picture. In the electric universe, all stars produce heavy elements at their surface, in their photospheres, where strong electrical discharge activity is taking place. And of course, on Earth in the laboratory, this is exactly the way we produce isotopes and heavier elements in the laboratory is by electric power uh, applied to accelerators. So there's nothing mysterious there. The standard model, on the other hand, requires purely theoretical and untestable things to be going on unseen inside stars. When it comes to a uh, star exploding, the electrical model is simplicity itself, and it doesn't require the star to be of any particular age because in the electrical model, of course, electrical power is supplied to all stars and is the source of their light and heat and the radiation from them. Now, Hans Alfane pointed out that the circuits in space also include what are called double layers, where charge is separated across a very small region of space. Those double layers can act like a switch, and if that switch is thrown, then the circuit is broken and all of the energy stored in the magnetic fields of that circuit, which can extend far beyond the star into the galaxy itself, is concentrated on that double layer, that switch. 
And that switch can actually be at the surface of a star. So a supernova explosion is purely an electrical explosion. It's the kind of thing that has been photographed and you can see on YouTube when high voltage transmission power lines, the circuit is opened at the, an inappropriate time and a huge arc stretches between the two electrodes as they separate. So you could say that what you're looking at in a supernova explosion is the opening of a stellar switch when that star suddenly brightens to the point where it can outshine all of the rest of the stars in that galaxy. For continuous news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to thunderbolts.info. The most critical test of the electric comet came on July 4th, 2005. That was when NASA's Deep Impact Probe fired an 800-pound copper projectile at the nucleus of Comet Temple 1. Cameras on the probe recorded the event, and even the projectile itself contained a camera to transmit data up to the moment of impact. As early as 2001, looking ahead to this event, electrical theorist Wallace Thornhill began anticipating the surprises in store for comet science. On the evening of July 3rd, 2005, the day before the encounter, the Thunderbolts website published the predictions of Thornhill and his colleagues. These predictions would clearly contrast the standard and the electric comet models. As the Deep Impact probe approached Temple 1, key NASA figures gathered in the control room. The comet was racing toward the probe at some 23,000 miles per hour when the probe launched its copper impactor toward the nucleus. If the comet was electrically charged, how would the electronics of the impactor respond to the electric field? Through most of its journey, the impactor's signal was clear, but in the final seconds, the signal was indeed disrupted. This apparent electrical disturbance was not all that Thornhill predicted. He also anticipated an advanced flash ahead of the projectile's impact, a uniquely electrical event. This is exactly what occurred. And the advanced flash left NASA scientists scratching their heads. NASA investigators were well aware of the kinetics of impact explosions. But would the projectile be striking a solid icy surface or a more loose aggregation of snowy fluff? They did not consider the electrical energy of the comet, but Thornhill had long predicted the explosion would be greater than any NASA scientist envisioned. It seems that the spectacular explosion that followed the impact was the greatest surprise. Every scientist viewing the live images expressed his astonishment. The scientists had expected to peer into a deep hole in a cometary, dirty snowball before the deep impact vehicle was too far away. 
but the erupting cloud of silica dust was so thick and the explosion so sustained that it completely obscured Thomas, the local no terrain. detection of Temple One subsurface ice was ever reported. Nevertheless, mission scientists tell us that infrared readings did detect substantial water ice in the ejecta cloud. The Enigma deserves investigation. What happened at the surface and below the surface at the moment of impact? Most NASA scientists interpreted the fast-moving cloud as vaporized silicates. The cloud was self-luminous at an estimated 1,000 to 2,000 degrees Kelvin, and the low angle of the impact and blast propelled the ejecta downrange. The infrared readings of the ejecta occurred about three seconds after impact, as the cloud came into the view of the infrared camera. These readings show what NASA scientists describe as a narrow beam of water. This water column was easily distinguished from the rapidly moving dust cloud and was very close to vertical directly over the impact site. That's a bizarre contrast to the trajectory of the dust cloud. How did a vertical column of water get instantaneously separated from an explosion of dust heated to over 1,000 degrees and propelled downrange? The electric comet model offers an answer. The heated silicate cloud would be ionized, a plasma, a conductive pathway for an explosive electric discharge. The evidence indicates the discharge occurred between a negatively charged nucleus and a surrounding region of positive charge. An abundance of hydrogen ions gathered at or close to the surface of the nucleus would provide the necessary conditions for two things. First, an instantaneous electrical breakdown or discharge on impact and second, an equally instantaneous electrochemical response to the discharge. Consider what is already known from laboratory experiments. In a condition of electrical breakdown, hydrogen ions from the solar wind, combining with the oxygen and silicates, can produce an abundance of hydroxyl and or water. This very process has been proposed to explain the enigmatic water on the planet Mercury. According to the popular model, it's the pressurized gases of volatiles beneath the surface that explain the impressive velocities of cometary jets. As a last resort in the search for water on Temple One, NASA scientists hoped to identify the vents for its jets. The vents were never found. When viewed through the lens of standard theory, some predictions of the electric model could only appear absurd. Thornhill anticipated that the locations of the comet jets could actually shift as charge redistribution occurred on the nucleus after a significant electrical event. Confirmation of this prediction came from the Nordic Optical Telescope in La Palma, Spain. As released by the observatory, two images of the comet before impact and hours later tell the story emphatically. Fifteen hours after the blast, new jets appeared far from the location of the impact itself. The 
Deep Impact mission promised to give us the best images ever of a comet nucleus. On the eve of the impact, the Thunderbolts group stated the electrically predicted surface features in no uncertain terms. The surface of Temple 1 astonished the experts. Expansive mesas and steep vertical ridges did not belong on a comet, and the presence of craters sparked a debate that continues today. Fortunately, scientists had an opportunity for a second look at Temple 1. After the Stardust mission to Comet Vilt 2, that probe was redirected to the object of the Deep Impact mission. Stardust was then renamed NEXT, or New Exploration of Temple 1. It would give additional views of the comet's surface. With the arrival of the next probe, old mysteries only grew more perplexing, leaving scientists to debate the contradictions of theory. Even the scalloping of mesa walls and nearly vertical ridges, something we've mentioned so often in connection with electric discharge machining, was duly noted by NASA scientists. At least 60 craters were counted, though collisions along the comet's path would be exceedingly rare if occurring at all, and the surfaces of active comets are rapidly eroded, far too rapidly to preserve a record of rare impacts across geologic timescales. In fact, most astronomers now reject explanation by impact, and that includes Michael Ahern, the principal investigator of the Deep Impact mission. What then was responsible for the pervasive cratering of the Temple 1 surface? Laboratory experiments have shown that entire fields of craters are readily produced by electric arcs to a negatively charged surface. Nothing observed on cometary nuclei has contradicted the electrical interpretation. Here is the most fundamental question one could ask about active comets. Is electric arcing occurring at the surface? If so, should we not see this arcing where there is sufficient camera resolution? We have a good example in the energetic plumes of Jupiter's moon Io, where the sensors of the Galileo probe were saturated by apparent electric arcs, producing blotches of whiteout. A second example came with the Stardust mission and the appearance of small saturation points on the surface of Comet Vilt 2, but with insufficient resolution to make a definitive case for what the electrical theorists suspected. The enigmatic whiteouts on the active surface of Temple 1 were everything the electrical theorists could have asked for, and the most prominent were placed exactly where the electric model envisions them. Eroding the cliffs of mesa walls and extending the floors of numerous craters and depressions. Fortunately, the Swift satellite provided a view of the comet explosion not just in visible light, but in ultraviolet wavelengths, which often give the best pointers to electrical events. The ultraviolet emissions required temperatures of over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 
The temperatures of the blast will explain why the initial eruption saturated the sensors on the deep impact probe. Calculations based on pixel saturation indicated a minimum initial temperature of the flash at almost 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Though saturation means the temperature could have been much higher. The first purpose of the Deep Impact mission was to excavate the envisioned subsurface water ice. But electrical theorists have consistently predicted little or no water on most comet nuclei. Nothing approaching the expected levels of water was detected in the exploding cloud. A lack or absence of volatiles can only mean that something is fundamentally wrong in standard comet theory. See, we got Grouch here. We got uh, Nick. Uh, man, it's good to see everybody. We got 41 people watching. I'm going to keep rolling. We're going to watch one more here. This is a really good one, too. All right, I will. Uh, let's see. I got to do a couple things here. All right, I got the. Um, okay, I got that going. All right, I'm just going to shut myself down, put on a song, and line up the video. I'll be right back. Thanks for sticking out with me.
Well, that was Dogstar. He, he laid his music on me. I said, you give me your music and I'll play it. That was good stuff, man.
are no islands in space. And in fact, this is the world.
Hello there. I wanted to make this video for the uh, little demonstration or I don't know what you really want to call it, storyboard, I guess, from John Cook. I think it's just absolutely brilliant and it needs attention. And uh, I'm just doing this for the sole purpose of pointing it out and making it a little easy for you to digest. Not only that, but it was made four years ago, and I know he's no longer with us, which is a damn shame. The guy had, uh, he was rich with knowledge, so I'm going to preserve it for sure. It's definitely worth it, just in case, you never know. I am not in the know whether or not anyone is taking care of his stuff. Just in case they're not, it needs to be preserved. But uh, definitely follow the link and go and visit. It's pretty crazy. He put a lot of work into it, I can tell. But this is a little synopsis of it, and I just made it for you. So in this video, I took the reading of the paper that he has included, Recovering the Lost World, while it shows. Enjoy. A historical synopsis of Saturnian cosmology from John Cook's website, saturniancosmology.org. There will be a link in the description. He gets pretty deep. The chapters of this site will propose that the biology of our planet, our culture, our psychology, and our very existence are the result of a series of incidents arising from the interaction between Earth and other planets within the solar system, most notably Saturn. The biology of Earth is such that a complete accident, and so utterly unlike it will not have ever been duplicated anywhere at any time among the billions of other star systems. But here on Earth, all of it, especially the rise of complex species since the Cambrian period 560 million years ago, can be attributed to a series of cataclysmic plasma strikes by Saturn each of a very long duration. Biologists claim 10,000 years for the extinction events. My original estimate was 15,000 years. As hominids, we survived the last externally induced extinction event, which gave rise to eight competing subspecies over the course of the last three million years. Our only contribution to our distinction from other animals was the invention 10,000 years ago of language and its subsequent cultural transmission that set the stage for further development of our humanity. Much later on, and much closer to our time, subjective consciousness. It all started very long ago, at one time, and from its genesis, Earth was a planet in orbit around Saturn, a brown dwarf star, toward the end of the Precambrian, 600 million years ago. The Saturnian system intersected with the solar system. Saturn was swept around the sun and back into deep space to return at regular 26 to 27 million year intervals over the course of time, some of the satellites, planets of Saturn, were wrenched from their orbits around Saturn to end up revolving around the Sun instead. The Earth likely became a solar system planet at the end of the Permian 250 million years ago. From 600 million years ago, Saturn kept entering the solar system regularly to disturb its lost satellites, now circling the Sun. At about 3 million years ago, Saturn likely had a run-in with Jupiter, a solar system planet at that time, orbiting the Sun at a distance probably somewhat less than the Earth's orbit today. The orbital period of Saturn was significantly reduced as a result. During the last 3 million year period, Saturn started scavenging its lost satellites, and perhaps solar system planets, all in orbit close to the Sun. The possibility of a captured planet again orbiting Saturn at its equator is virtually nil. Instead, the scavenged planets ended up in superpolar or subpolar locations, the only locations which seem to be dynamically stable.
because Saturn had come in from outside of the solar system, and most likely was a star originally, it would have been at a very high positive charge level, distinct from the solar system planets. Solar system planets would have been attracted to Saturn when Saturn entered the solar system, rather than be repelled, as would be the case of two planets with nearly equal values of charge. Saturn, with its stack of captured planets, was seen by hominids Homo erectus and recorded in the shapes of artifacts in the Paleolithic of about two million years ago, and by humans, Homo sapiens, as carved images in the Upper Paleolithic from 30,000 BC, and by the hundreds of millions during the Early Neolithic, 10,000 to 3,000 BC, when the stack of planets was much more frequently seen. At about 10,900 BC, Earth, at that time a planet of the Sun, made an electric field contact with Saturn, causing 1,500 years of darkness, oh yeah, shadow on Earth. The period of darkness is recognized by many of the world's creation myths and was recorded in the illustrated graphic books of Mesoamerica, references to which are made in colonial period documents. Climatologically, the period is identified today as the Younger Dryas, when for some 1,500 years Earth got as cold as it had ever been. Over the next 7,000 years, the orbit of Earth, apparently equal to the orbit of Saturn at that time, but below Saturn, progressively moved laterally to have Earth's orbital path eventually travel below the center of Saturn. Thus, between 10,900 BC and 3147 BC, Earth was part of a strange configuration of stacked planets, a condition which provided long summers and a mild climate in the northern hemisphere. Planets dominated by the giant form of Saturn stood above the north, the north horizon and close to Earth, but measured in millions of miles, and were taken by humans to be gods, who supported them, and for whose benefit they labored at agriculture and conducted trade. Initially, during a 1500 year period after 10,900 BC, when the cold of the Younger Dryas set in, and long before Saturn was clearly seen, Three fiercely lighted ball plasmoids were seen far south of Earth. Below the South Pole, between about 10,900 BC and 8347 BC, these connected to Saturn and the North via strands of brilliant arcs of electrons. Forms of various shapes ran south over these electron lines, traveling toward the three plasmoids. The moving shapes were taken to be dead animals and dead humans. The objects in the sky became the basis for all original religions and a good deal of mythology throughout the world, for they persisted in showing nightly and seasonally over the course of 2500 years to 8347 BC, although only for three periods of hundreds of years. For the people of Mesoamerica, the year 8347 BC, when the last of the plasmoids extinguished after 2,500 years was the end of their first tally of years, which accounted for the first creation. We know only a little about these ball plasmoids from obscure mythological references, and we would still not know very much if it had not been for an investigation undertaken by a team led by Anthony Pratt of Las Alamos National Labs of some four million petroglyphs worldwide, carved high up on mountainsides facing in all directions, but always with a clear view toward the south. That study, published in the journal IEEE Transactions on Plasma Science in 2003, was an absolutely astounding revelation. More on that in a later chapter. In 4077 BC, Saturn dropped its coma. This had been the chaos before creation which had lasted some 7,000 years. It had obscured Saturn and its companion satellites. Saturn went nova. It switched to arc mode in a mass expulsion. Saturn produced its rings and a new satellite, Venus, and perhaps another. That's interesting. So they're saying that Venus came from Saturn and not Jupiter, like Golikovsky does. Okay. And Saturn lit up more brilliantly than the sun to the humans of Earth. 
who had not clearly seen the real sun for thousands of years, because of the shadow of the younger Dryas, followed by the obscurity of the enclosing plasma sphere of Saturn. This was the start of creation, start of time, and the first showing of the land and its resident gods, the satellites of Saturn. Saturn was universally called the sun throughout the world. In Central America, the Papal Vu, written circa A.D. 1600, from much older records, recounts, like a man was the sun when it showed itself. It showed itself when it was born and remained fixed in the sky like a mirror. Certainly it was not the same sun which we see. It is said in their old tales. In arc mode, Saturn would have lost its glow mode coma, but it apparently retained a plasma stream connection to Earth. The sun, and the real sun, lighted part of the edge of Saturn in a crescent which revolved around Saturn on a daily basis, visually caused by a daily rotation of Earth below Saturn. This stack of planets consisted from top to bottom of Uranus on its side as today and Neptune, both hidden by Saturn below them, known in Mesoamerica from earlier times. I suspect that these three planets had been seen together for perhaps two million years, initially by Homo erectus. Below Saturn, the following were located from top to bottom. Mercury joined the group in about 14,000 BC. Mars, resident probably since at least 30,000 BC or earlier, and Earth joined the group after 10,900 BC. In 3147 BC, this configuration of standing planets broke apart, with three large planets moving far away from the Sun and Earth and Venus, released to overlapping inner orbits. The breakup produced a stupendous flood of the waters, which had been held at the south polar region due to the gravitational attraction of Saturn for some 7,000 years. The water held at the south pole was due to the lifting up of the Earth's crust in the Arctic and the sinking toward the Earth's interior in the Antarctic. Flood stories are ubiquitous, found in over 500 independent myths, all with the same coherent details. The survivors included people far inland and those living already on mountain slopes, and apparently the people of the Nile Delta and northern Mesopotamia. The only recourse to a livelihood for many of the survivors was agriculture, which soon sprang up simultaneously in six unconnected regions of Earth. The breakup was caused by Jupiter, which had circled the Sun as an inner planet up to that time. Jupiter was subsequently seen receding in the skies, surrounded by a coma visually three times larger than the diameter of the Moon today. Below the south pole of Jupiter extended a gigantic plasma outpouring, making it look like Jupiter was resting on a mountain. It was green initially. Above the planet were much smaller horn-like extensions. The whole of this looked like a person in a mantle, but was also identified as the Bull of Heaven. Jupiter was taken as the new god, called the Younger. Jupiter retained its massive lower outpouring until it entered the asteroid belt in about 2860 BC, after which the coma reduced in size and changed its shape. After 3070 BC, Mars and Mercury, which had remained in their positions below Saturn, were released when Saturn entered the asteroid belt. The two planets crossed Earth's orbit for about 300 years, overriding the Earth's orbit close to Earth on a 30-year or 15-year average intervals. At those times, Mars was at times brought into plasma contact with Earth, looking like a squat mountain which circled the Earth. The visual effect of the rotation of Earth, with Saturn and Jupiter both disappearing into the ecliptic. Mars was held to be the god in charge of Earth, Horus of the Egyptians. This lasted till about 2750 BC or 2700 BC, after which the regular visits of Mars ended its elliptical orbit, perhaps rotating away from Earth, an apocidal procession. In the next century, people throughout the world start building pyramids in imitation of the disappeared mountain of Mars, all within a hundred years of each other. In Egypt, 
Mesopotamia, England, China, and the Andes of South America, and many other locations such as Greece and the Balkans, as has been discovered in recent years, although not validated. We have recorded histories of these celestial events, especially in Mesoamerica. There are accurate descriptions of the rings and the number of satellites of Saturn, the cloud bands and satellites of Jupiter, and the scarred surface and satellites of Mars all dating from antiquity spanning cultures worldwide. The Egyptians produced schematic images of the original configuration of Saturn and the satellite planets below and have a record of early close passes by Mars. Mesopotamians also produced images of planets, graphically showing, for example, all the satellites of Jupiter. The Maya, from Olmec sources, have an undated record of the planetary movements from long before 3147 BC, and a dated record of later events which matches what can be gleaned from Eastern Mediterranean sources. The Aztecs produced graphic images of these planets, although anthropomorphized, to gods and produced very late. South Sea Islanders have similar records of rings of Saturn. India has similar recollection of these events extending over millions of lines of poetry. The Quiche, Maya, Papa Vu, and pages of the Maya books of the Chilambalam makes casual reference to the period of 13,000 years ago, probably 10,900 BC. One page of the Chilambalam records seven appearances of the Saturnian planets as far back as perhaps 40,000 years which can be collated with atmospheric carbon-14 records dating from 50,000 BP. Over the next 2,500 years, 3147 BC to 685 BC, the inner planets interfered with Earth at intervals, although very infrequently. There were four major additional incidents. The damage often was localized in latitude, although, for example, a continuous lightning strike might have encircled the globe in circa 1492 BC, and certainly repeatedly in the 8th and 7th century BC. As recalled by nearly all peoples on all continents, the most terrifying incident, however, happened in 2349 BC, when an alignment with Venus, 20 million miles away at the time, 32,200,000 kilometers, produced an Earth shock in the Northern Hemisphere, tilting the Earth's axis away from the Sun temporarily and tilting up the equatorial rings of the Earth. Earth at one time had equatorial rings. This was followed perhaps six hours later by the arrival of a massive disconnected plasmoid lightning bolt from Venus, which hit the rings almost broadside, followed somewhat later by lesser bolts recorded in Mesoamerica and China. The electric contact with Venus turned the equatorial rings blood red and caused the destruction of the rings. Lightning bolts arc up to the rings from the Earth's ionosphere layers and the lower equatorial plasma toroid, the Van Allen belt. The sky bled for three days, and only a single ring remained. Thus continued to rain down for the next 4,000 years until A.D. 1600. The cleared southern skies previously obscured by the Earth's rings revealed a multitude of stars for the first time, most notably the Pleiades, located directly south at midnight, two nights after the equinox. The equatorial plasma toroid would have also arced to the surface of Earth, producing months of torrential rains. To humanity, the sea of the Earth's equatorial rings in the south sky, the Absu, had collapsed to Earth, and the event was almost everywhere understood as a second flood of stupendous proportions. The Bible recalls this event as the flood of Noah, but to most peoples, the blood seen in the sky suggested the wholesale slaughter of humanity, and any number of raging goddesses or dragons were assigned to this event in mythology worldwide. Kali, Tiamat, Anath, Sekhmet, Hathor, and much later, Beowulf's Grindel. After two and a half days, Jupiter appeared again with its previous giant coma and lower mantle, again understood as a mountain, as if risen from the dead. In fact, the rise of the equatorial in the sky made it look as if Jupiter rose up 
out of the cave previously seen as the shadow of the earth on the rings. The cave-shaped shadow opened up as the earth regained its normal inclination and Jupiter rose out of this to a location above it. Jupiter had stopped the dragon from killing additional humans. The event itself remains commemorated as the Day of the Dead, which is why they wear Halloween masks on Halloween. It's so that the spirits don't recognize them, the ones that might want revenge. I believe that's what that's about. And is almost universally associated with the culmination of the Pleiades in autumn. Echoes of the fall of the rings and the surrounding circumstances continued to re resound in mythology and to this day in the theologies and practices of many religions, especially the resurrection of Jupiter on the third day. Many nations also date the start of all sensible history and their calendars from this event. Strangely, this event is simply not noted by any of the catastrophists. Even Velikovsky remained unaware of it. Hmm, interesting. 800 years later, in 1492 BC, Venus again made an electric contact with Earth, causing a crushing repulsive blow in the East Central Pacific. The Pacific Islands were wiped clean of any trace of humans, except for the petroglyphs carved on every island thousands of years earlier. Coastal South America and Central America were inundated with water, leaving seawater traces in lakes high up in the Andes and possibly causing a sudden rise in the coastal range of the Andes by thousands of feet. The blow was followed by an electric arc traveling through the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and part of India, following a path of increasingly higher latitude into the Mediterranean as the Earth's axis angled back toward the Sun. Moses made his escape from Egypt during the turmoil. The event is recalled in mythology as the attack of the monster Typhon, who is struck down by Zeus. The major result of the contact was a 30% increase in the orbit of the Earth. The year went from 273 days to 360 days. Venus probably came no closer than 10 million miles. In this instance, 16 million kilometers. Something else was initiated at this time. The movement of tribes away from devastated areas and failing climates into new regions happened after 1492 BC. Tribes of Central Asia entered India. Anatolia in Greece. Tribes from Asia Minor settled in Italy, as well as at later dates also. People everywhere met strangers and had to cope with new living conditions. This resulted in an expansion of our imagination as a way of coping with these changes. The development of subjective consciousness. Before this time, there was little need to deal with change. The people of Egypt and Mesopotamia, for whom we have records, have remained stagnant in the way of life of their forebears for thousands upon thousands of years. The development of subjective consciousness, as opposed to mere consciousness, was a cultural innovation and the major change which made us humans. Subjective consciousness came to be taught to children by parents, exactly like language is taught. The teaching of subjective consciousness like the teaching of language, can be readily observed today. Note 5. Another 700 years later, 806 BC to 687 BC, Mars closed in on Earth with repeated electric arc contact at 15-year intervals. A major Earth shock in 747 BC and a minor shock in 686 BC, this last caused by Mercury. Earlier, Mars also interfered with Earth in similar fashion at the close of the early Bronze Age, 1935 to circa 1700 BC, which includes the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mars came close, perhaps within 40,000 miles of Earth. The interactions, as a result, were completely different from the long-distance shock due to Venus. The destructions of the 8th and 7th century BC were spread over long stretches from Central Asia to the Western Mediterranean, and through to Mexico and Southern United States. From the Persian Plateau to Greece, in swaths measuring more than 600 miles wide, hilltop citadels were destroyed by quake-like convulsions, much more extensive than any earthquake, and by massive lightning strikes. 
Cities and citadels were buried under yards of carbonized material mixed with soil. The soil and burned forests were dropped whenever the traveling lightning bolt paused at a hilltop. Oh, that's pretty crazy. I mean, this lightning bolt traveling around just going anywhere. These simultaneous destructions have been noted in the archaeological record and include the events of the 8th and 7th century as well as 1935 BC. De Grazia estimates that only 2.5 percent of the original population of 200 million of the Mediterranean region survived. Bolsena, a city in Italy, was obliterated by a lightning bolt measuring more than five miles eight kilometers in, in diameter. If we are to believe Pliny, who presents this from older Etruscan sources, the circular lake at Bolsena, the circular lake at Bolsena is larger than any volcanic caldera. Mars became the next sky god to set a tone for human conduct lasting to this day. The destructions of the 8th and 7th century BC obliterated the coastal areas of Greece and coastal Anatolia. The remnant population turned to raiding and became the pirates celebrated in the Iliad as the Egyptian people of the sea. The Iliad reveals that these were no sailors. Warfare and the extraction of tribute also became a way of life for the Assyrians, who plundered from Elam to Egypt. The change in humanity, however, which suddenly brought up, brought people up to our current expectations, was an event which happened early in the 7th century BC. In 685 BC, Venus and Mercury blazed as bright as the sun and were seen in the daytime skies, with the sun for 40 days, starting on June 15th. The event was probably an extraordinary plasma outpouring by the Sun, brought on by a sudden relocation of Mercury to within the orbit of Venus in the previous year. In July 685 BC, actually the astronomical year minus 685, corrected from 680 BC, Julian in the Eastern Mediterranean chronology, Ah, okay, so that's what the minus is for. It's different. It's astronomical. Okay. Jupiter also erupted with a coma in response in... Jupiter also erupted in a coma in response to the Sun's increased output of plasma. And on July 14th, sent a return lightning stroke, a plasmoid bolt headed for the Sun. It arrived at the Sun on July 25th. The plasmoid, which, which passed by the Earth at a distance of 30 million miles, 48 million kilometers, was seen in foreshortened form by Asia and Europe. How about that Jupiter taking a swing at the sun? <laughs> and is depicted in sculptures and illustrations and even on coins. Mediterranean nations thought that Venus or Mercury was struck the bolt from Zeus which toppled Phaethon from the sun's chariot. Mesoamerica saw the plasmoid at full length as it passed by in the daytime. That would be wild to see something like that, and depicted it correspondingly differently. Their understanding was that Mars was struck. It was called the bundle of flame. Among the Maya, to China this was the celestial dragon, the traditional form of which matches the structure of a plasmoid lightning bolt. Note 6. One could spend a lot of hours on this website here with this. This is amazing. Um, got a little bit more to go here. As experienced by Earth, the after effect of the 40 days of extreme solar activity was the relocation of the polar axis from Ursa Major to near Ursa Minor and the delay of spring by some 15 days in effect changing the inclination of the polar axis, which is equivalent to rotating the dome of the stars. A new equinox was suddenly established, the aphelion of the Earth's orbit. The location furthest from the Sun changed 
and 120 years of interference by Mars and Mercury came to a sudden halt. It appeared to many that Jupiter, the historical supreme god of antiquity, had again saved mankind from destruction. The change in Aphelion had resulted in a cessation of further interactions with Mars. In 670 BC, the Earth's orbit became nearly circular, for unknown reasons. And the Earth was in fact completely removed from any future interference by any of the inner planets. It's probably the Sun's uh, magnetic sphere, I'd imagine. Within 100 years of this event, we see the simultaneous rise of philosophical studies, much as we understand them today, in China, India, Mesopotamia, Anatolia, North Africa, and Rome. Well before there was any cultural transmission before the more distant regions on the list, in this list. It appeared to many as if a far greater power beyond the dome of the stars had moved the stars and planets and restarted the universe. For many years of the philosophers, the causes for natural phenomena were now sought elsewhere than in the whims of old planetary gods. With the realization of the existence of a power beyond the planets and stars, we also see the sudden rise of all the modern religions within the span of 100 years. Taoism and Confucianism in China, Jainism and Buddhism in India, with its subsequent influence on Hinduism, Zoroastrianism in Persia, with its influence on Judaism, Mithraism, Christianity, and eventually on Islam. Similar changes seem to be attested to in Mesoamerica, probably dating from 600 BC. Could all this really have happened? Religions have attempted to explain all of it, initially as narrations of the observed events, eventually as metaphors of spiritual states. Science, on the other hand, has spent the last 200 years denying that anything at all ever happened. But look at the histories, what we call myths, of people from regions as diverse as China, Mesopotamia, and Mesoamerica will reveal that they are in complete agreement with each other. Add to these various myths of the people of India, South America, Africa, Greece, and thousands of others, and a consistent picture of the past emerges, which is not what science tells us. Or flyover regions, for example, of the Western United States, and you will soon be convinced that the waves of hills, the conical dumps of wind-borne soil, the distorted folded mountains, the widely varied landscape, cannot possibly be the result of eons of slow movement and metamorphosis of the Earth's crust. The surface of the Earth appears to have been battered and racked convulsively, and widely varied landscape and recently. Except for geology, which I will not really touch on, the remaining chapters will fill in the details and broaden the scope for major events. The four events are the end of the age of the gods and the worldwide flood of 3147 BC, the fall of the Absu, known as the flood of Noah, the blood in the sky, the resurrection of Jupiter and the first appearance of the Pallades, 2349 BC, the defeat of Typhon and the exodus of Moses from Egypt in 1492 BC, and the blazing of Venus and Mercury and the thunderbolt of Jupiter, which toppled Phaethon in 685 BC. The last few chapters present an excursion into the site plans and iconography of Mesoamerica from about 2000 BC. In these last chapters, you will find that the more closely detailed findings from Mesoamerica will match and often exceed the information available from the Eastern Mediterranean. I can't thank you enough. Okay, that'll do it for me this time around. Take care. I'll see you on down the road.
up my days The sunshine falls out the rain And I'm trying to find myself Just don't know where to begin Cry me some tears Let all these memories just disappear Well, folks, it's that time of day again. We're at the end. And it won't be long. My kids will be getting up. <laughs> I'll have to feed them breakfast. I had a great time hanging out with you. Thanks for listening to the songs and hanging out with me. We'll do it again soon. I really enjoy this. And look out for part two 
of Invisible Rainbow. It's going to be very intriguing, to say the least. Good night.